Um, up next is um, our friend Peter Shea, who's an associate professor in the Department of Education Theory and Practice with a joint appointment in informatic, in the informatics program at UAlbany. Um, Peter is also associate provost for online learning and, well, I think you guys know who he is. <laughs> um, welcome, Peter. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks for uh, having me back. Appreciate the opportunity to share uh, some of the research that we're doing. How many people read the comments sections of websites that you, that you frequent? And how many people post questions or comments yourself in those websites? And, and don't you sometimes wish, I wish somebody would read this, and I really wish they'd do something about what I have to say, because what I have to say is so important. Nobody? I, I do that all the time. I'm, like, I'm, I'm really <laughs> I want to share with you sort of the genesis of some of the research that we're doing. Um, this came out of work that was done by folks uh, at the Community College Research Center, a Teachers College at Columbia University. Uh, they were finding struggles among community college students, and the struggles that they were reporting were struggles in online learning uh, settings. And that was picked up by some other folks. How many people have heard of Jill Bar Shea, by any chance? Uh, she writes something called the Hetchinger Report. And it's kind of obscure. It's like, okay, who's she? I don't know who she is. <clears throat> and she wrote an article that was highlighting all of the downsides of online learning in the community college setting based on the work of, of people at the Teachers College, at Teachers college uh, Community College Research Center. And I was looking at it and I thinking, well, that's pretty gloomy the way she's framing this. So I wrote a comment on her website thinking, oh, that'll never get anywhere. And then it turns out she's actually kind of a big deal. I didn't know. She writes for the New York Times. She writes for the Wall Street Journal. She's been on CNN. She's been on ABC. And also she reads the comments section of her website, <laughs> which was kind of surprising to me because she not only read the, the comments section, but she also wrote another article after that and said, oops, you know, I, I, I said all this stuff about how bad community college students are doing uh, in online settings, but that was only part of the story. And Peter Shea con contacted me and turns out, I guess this guy has done like some study or something. <laughs> and uh, she, no, she was very respectful, but she did interview me. And uh, so it was like, okay, that's fixed, good. And then that got picked up by the Chronicle of Higher Education, and they wanted to do some more work on this and find out what's going on with this community college paradox that they were calling it. And then it got picked by, up by U.S. News and World Report. So if you think that you can't have any effect by writing your comments in the comments section of a website, <laughs> let this be a lesson to you. You can actually have some kind of uh, effect. So I want to talk to you about online learning, some of what we know, what we don't know about online learning. And I just wanted to share that it's not all just boring people with their heads down looking at numbers all the time. That there's The genesis of, of research in this area can come from different places. Um, I'm right now in the middle of uh, fin finalizing the journal that will issue, that will come out on Thursday, tomorrow. Jill's here. She's the <laughs> senior director for research, and she oversees that, making sure that we get this stuff done right and done well. And one of the things that we do with the journal is review the articles that get submitted. And a lot of times, you see people saying things about online learning in a literature review section that's just plain wrong. And it's really frustrating. And I'm working with some doctoral students now to try to get them to understand some of the big sort of picture results that we know about online learning. So <clears throat> there's been at least 16 different meta-analyses of online and distance education. George Siemens and his colleagues just did a the biggest literature review in the world that no one has ever read. <laughs> it's been cited five times, and it's 250 pages long. It's just like, wow, that's a lot of effort. You guys got to do something to, to get, that, get the word out. But the big results on this are that, you know, we always say, oh, people learn just as well online as they do in the classroom. That's not true. That's not what the research says. What the research says is half of the studies say they do better, and the other half say they do worse, right? That's a very different result than saying they do just as well as you know, one environment as the other. 
What it really says is there's a lot of variance in the outcomes of, of research and online learning. Half the time they do better, half the time they do worse. What are the contexts under which students do better is the research question we want to be asking ourselves. For whom is it better? Under what conditions is it better? When, why, how? What's the active ingredient in online learning? If online learning is a treatment, what's its active ingredients? So we want to know what makes the difference when there's significantly different findings in, in the research. Um, one of the areas where there's differences that are pretty reliable and have been investigated with very large sample sizes are community college students. And we know that community college students tend to struggle in online learning settings uh, relative to other kinds of students. Um, they, uh, Shauna Smith Jaggers, who's actually on the editorial board for the Online Learning Journal and her colleagues at Teacher College have done a lot of res this research, whole statewide studies, with the statewide studies in Virginia, statewide studies in Washington, and they're finding you know, significant differences uh, in a bunch of different areas. So uh, students with higher, students at higher course dropout rates and lower grades in online courses compared to face-to-face -face courses at the community college level. <clears throat> Those negative findings are amplified uh, with male students, younger students, African American students. So there's, a, there's some known predictors of success uh, in education. And not only are those achievement gaps replicated online in community college settings, they're amplified according to the data that they're looking at in Virginia and Washington. So achievement gaps are not just, you know, okay, we, got, we know there's achievement gaps in the classroom. We'll probably see them online. In the community college space, they're worse. They get worse online. Um, students who took online courses were less likely to, re to return, and there were lower course grades, higher course withdrawal, amplification, achievement gap. So all those bad things have been found in Virginia and in Washington State. Those are only two states. There are 48 other states. We found some different results when we looked at national data. So this paradox that they were talking about in um, the Hetchinger Report, the Chronicle, U.S. News and World Report, has to do with the fact that although students appear to do worse at the course level with all those diminished course level sort of performances in, in the community college setting, they do better at the program level. They're more likely to get to graduate um, if they're taking a mix of online courses and classroom courses. So the question was, wait, you know, why is that happening? And there's a variety of potential answers. We don't know exactly why that happens. So we kind of tried to figure out, like, are, we, are, are these findings that they have in Virginia and Washington and, and to some extent in California, are those happening in SUNY? You know, we're especially concerned to see whether there was an amplification of achievement gaps among uh, certain subpopulations. So. We, wrote a, we did a study in last year that was published last year showing that although achievement gaps are replicated from the classroom to online settings among community college students, in SUNY they're not amplified. They don't get worse. So that was one kind of nuanced result that was kind of good news for us. Um, we also did research looking at data from the National Center for Education Statistics collected by the Department of Education that showed that students who mixed classroom and online courses were um, more likely to complete a degree and no less likely to drop out, uh, or no more likely to drop out than um, students only studying in the classroom. So we're, there's some inconsistent findings. The big picture is that there's inconsistency in the findings. But there's also some consistent, some pretty consistent findings. Um, online course load is a predictor of uh, diminished outcomes in academic performance. So in California, in New York, in Virginia, in uh, Washington, um, the more, the higher the proportion of online courses that students take relative to classroom courses, there's a diminishment in, in achievement, there's a diminishment in academic outcomes. So there's different data sources for this. So for example, Karen Swan worked with the Predictive Analytics Reporting Framework campuses. I think it was <clears throat> more than 30 campuses at one point who were aggregating data. And they were trying to see, OK, among these millions of students, what's the outcomes? And they're finding that 
um, mixing online and face-to-face, -face, uh, taking, uh, if you're mixing courses, there's a much better chance that you'll complete a degree. But when students are taking fully online courses, there's a diminishment of degree completion. When they're only taking online courses, they're just a full online load. We found that students who are mixing uh, in, in, uh, at the national level, no, this isn't SUNY, at one, uh, the degree attainment was 1.5 times higher for students who had a combination of online and traditional, but two to three times lower for students who only took online courses. So we know that from data that was reported this morning that most students in SUNY are mixing online and classroom course load and probably getting the benefit that mixing online and classroom confers in terms of degree completion. So what we don't know is at what point does it become a problem? Right? We know that there, there appears to be a situation under which taking some online courses assists students towards a degree, a goal of degree attainment. Taking all online courses inhibits that in some ways. It, it reduces the chance of getting a degree. So what's the tipping point? Where should you be in terms of the balance of online to face-to-face -face courses? And is there a way to answer that question? So. That's what we did. We took, we had these three research questions. We're trying to find a threshold for online course enrollment that jeopardizes prospects for successful completion. And then we're trying to look and see, does the intensity of online coursework modify the effect of other traditional predictors? So if you're taking online courses, does it amplify or does it make things worse for certain students who might otherwise struggle with completing a degree? And then we looked and said, you know, some of the schools in SUNY have higher graduation rates than others. And you gotta wonder, you know, there's a, they're doing something where they're graduating rate, students at higher rates and, and are probably not particularly different populations among the community colleges. The community colleges probably are all open access. They all attract students who are on average pretty similar in background. But they're doing something different where we know that some of the campuses have higher graduation rates than others across the board. Is there a spillover effect uh, in terms of online student graduation rates? And does that spillover effect have shape the kinds of outcomes that students might experience in their balance of online to classroom courses? So is there a, a, a mediating effect of the institution's ability to graduate students that will uh, change the balance of courses that are beneficial. So we know taking all the courses online, there's a diminishment. Taking some courses online, there's an enhancement. What's the tipping point, and does that vary by the quality of the institution's capacity to graduate overall, generally? So what do we do here? So we looked at all, you know 45,000 students in SUNY across 13 different semesters um, and used different kinds of uh, regression analysis to try to see if anybody, you know, when they, they get a degree. And the main factor of interest was the, their online course load, which was the percentage, a proportion of online credits attempted the total of, total of credits. So we can't just do this and say, yeah, not controlling for anything else. You know, there's a lot of other predictors that could predict whether students are going to complete a degree or not. So in order to do apples to apples comparisons, you want to include in a regression equation things like their demographic factors, their first semester and last semester indicators, cumulative measures that also predict degree completion. So you can factor out other you know, possibilities that would predict degree completion net of their uh, online course load. So we know, for example, that female students tend to complete degrees at higher than male students. So we want to account for that. That's just one example. So we accounted for a lot of other potential predictors in looking at this. So here's the, the results. I'm trying to figure out what this looks like. It looks like shooting fireworks into a lake from a hill or something. I don't know what it is. But what we're actually looking at is online course load on the, on the bottom and probability of the degree along the side. And what you see is that the probability of a degree goes up 
as the online course load increases up to a certain place. And the place is 40%, right? The place is 40%. On average, students can mix online and classroom courses at about, uh, at, they can have 40% of their course load be online and the rest be classroom. And there's uh, an enhancement uh, on their likelihood of degree completion. That's on average. So I think that's good news. We, we know, at least among this population, and probably among similar populations, that there is a, a number at which you can stop adding online courses to your load and get the benefits of enhanced degree completion. So again, that's 40% is the upper limit. Um, for optimum degree, degree completion benefits, students could be advised, I don't want to say should be advised, they could be advised to enroll ratio of three face-to-face -face courses to two online courses for full-time students. Why don't I want to say should be advised rather than could be advised? Some students can't do this, right? And if you want to get a degree, and we know the benefits of getting a college degree are so gigantic that we have to be very careful about what we advise students to do in different contexts. If students live 100 miles from the campus or if they live across the street from the campus, they've got three kids, a job, and everything else, and they're not going to be able to take classroom-based courses, we don't want to tell them, well, you've got to do it this way. You have to come to campus. You've got to do this. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, is if students are thinking about mixing courses, some classrooms, some online, they should know that these are, on average, the results that we're getting, that if you, if you do this proportion, you're likely to optimize your pathway towards degree completion, shorten your time to degree completion. So it's just something to be aware of. I'm, I'm not saying this is a one-size-fits-all solution, but it's something that advisors, at a minimum, should be aware of, I think. We also looked at the effect of overall institutional graduation rates on this trajectory, and we sorted uh, institutional graduation rates into low, medium, and high. And what we're finding is that in campuses that are more effective at, uh, or tend to graduate students at higher rates, students can take a higher proportion of online courses and still maintain the benefit. So they can take more online courses, not all of them, and get the benefit, but they can take more. And the institutions with lower graduation rates overall, would, they have diminished uh, outcomes. So students enrolled at in institutions with the highest graduation rates can mix up to 60% of online courses with, the, with classroom courses. So they can swap three to two instead of two to three for full-time students. There's, again, an average of 40% at all campuses. And at the least effective institutions, students should not be taking more than one online course to four classroom-based courses if they want to get the benefit of enhanced degree completion, shorter time to degree. So those were some interesting findings, I think. And we can probably, your institutions know how effective they are at graduating. But if they don't, we could probably let them know. And the advice that students could be given could be tempered based on that information. We also are interested in remedial students. Um, remedial students tend to um, graduate at lower rates regardless, right? And there's been a lot of concern in the literature about having remedial students taking any online courses. And I think uh, the, the work in Virginia and Washington, for example, was saying we should be uh, advising students completely out of online coursework. They shouldn't be in online courses. We're not finding that. So although you see, according to these curves, that the probability of degree completion for remedial students is lower than for non-remedial students, the benefit of taking a mix of online to classroom courses is no different. So remedial students can still be advised to take a balance of online and classroom courses and still receive the enhancement, the benefit of mixing online with face-to-face -face on degree completion in relatively the same proportion as non-remedial students. They're not going to have the, out the same outcomes. We don't expect that. But the, we do see that there's an enhanced uh, benefit for them that's no different for, on average from non-remedial students. 
So that's basically saying the same thing here. Um, so I think these results have both uh, some conceptual value and some practical value. Um, you know, conceptually, we're trying to figure out what's going on here. Why do some students uh, who are getting lower grades in the classroom still manage to complete degrees at higher rates? Now we know, well, they can do it, and they can do it if they balance it this way. Um, so conceptually, there's something. Practically, we know that we can make students aware of these results. We can help them understand, hey, if you're thinking about doing this and you are not constrained uh, from coming to the university, coming to the college, then you should. You should be coming for a certain number of courses here and taking a certain number of courses online. It'll speed your time to degree, save you money, save us money, and get you on your way faster. So I think there's a lot of practical applications of this too. So that's basically all I have to share, and I'm probably ahead of my time. So I, any questions about these results or any questions about the study? I think you have to talk into your mic or something. Can you turn it on? There's a little button. Yeah, is it on now? Okay. I think we've talked about this before. But there's, I didn't see any conversation about the, the number of credits Per semester, right? So when I advise the students in, in my charge, I say, if you're not doing financial aid, let's do slow and low your first or second term, right? Particularly if they've not been back to college for a while, right? Just sort of, you know, reorient and, you know, get some confidence, build some confidence. So does does that piece factor in here? Don't don't do that. Don't don't do that. <laughs> there was just a national study where they were looking uh, how students start behind and stay behind and get farther behind. No, oh, that's interesting. And I, you know, I have to read this a little bit more carefully, but we were discussing this just yesterday uh, in the president's retreat, and I, I think that there's sort of national level results that say try to get students to uh, enroll at a enrollment intensity that's relatively high. Even or else if they're they start to drop, drop behind, and then stay behind, and then drop out. So even if they're full, working full time, and yeah, I mean, there's a lot of caveats, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I don't, yeah. I don't think the general attitude should be let's start this as slow and low as possible. I think it should be, what's the maximum you think you can manage, and let's try that. You know, you don't want to overload people, but you don't no, definitely right. want to underload them. Either. Yeah. But I, again, this not the these were not the research questions we were asking right, in, this, right, in right. this particular study, right. and I so don't have no... systematic evidence to yeah. support that. I yeah. have a conversation I had yesterday to support that. So take it as you will. Can you sh would you? I'd be interested to see that article because what yeah. the advice I've heard is like Send completely. Me a note, I'll, I'll yeah, yeah, that would be great. Time. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So just make sure I understand this correctly. For those institutions with low comple completion rates, the data said recommending no more than one on for, for class. institutions that yeah have that fall into that bucket that were significantly lower in terms of uh, graduation rates than the medium and the highs. The be the benefit of t taking a mix of online and classroom goes down to one to four. Uh, that the curve starts significantly earlier. Do you have any discussions about what, how to explain that? You would think almost that maybe this would be a strategy that those institutions would follow to maybe increase their completion, yeah, right? I, I think, you know, there's follow-up research that I encourage you all to get involved with that we're not currently doing that would be to, to look and see what kind of retention services do we have? What kind of advisement services do we have? What kind of tutoring services do we have? What kind of, you know, writing support services do we have? How are we supporting our students from, from the time they get in to the time they get out? And, uh, and, you know, there are probably institutions that serve as, we know, just look, we, we have them. We, we know which ones are in each bucket. We didn't put this up here. But those institutions are probably doing something uh, right that others need to know about. We don't know exactly what that is, but it's a great question. What are they doing differently that's uh, allowing them to A, uh, 
graduate students at higher rates and b give students additional flexibility in how many online to face to face courses they take it right so those institutions should know that right so they should start first with not with online perhaps right they should be starting first with all those other yeah, services should, yeah. and then yeah. we could start that, looking at online you know, as again all online. this is one size doesn't fit all and we need to be sensitive to each individual student's life circumstances and it's better to complete a degree slowly than not to complete to complete a degree at all but you know if you have the opportunity to think think it through here at this institution you should be taking you know one to four on average so peter i have a question from twitter okay. for you um, are there any aspects that an institution can focus on that seem to increase the success rate other than mixing online and face-to-face? -face? Study. <laughs> no, I mean, there's probably a million other um, behaviors that students can engage in uh, that you know, aren't outside of the, the questions in this study. Um, you know, you pick it. There, there's a, a vast literature on how students can succeed online and how students can succeed in classrooms. But yeah, there's there's quite a few individual level behaviors and characteristics that predict success. Um, you know, we we've done work uh, that looks not only at what learners can do, but what instructors can do, and. You know, instructors can design courses that are much more user friendly to students if they uh, embed, you know, aspects of teaching presence and are sensitive to social presence and understand outcomes that are complex and consistent with the goals of higher education and how to get there. Um, but I think there's learning presence behavior, students' self regulatory behaviors that students can be aware of. And we've done research that shows that uh, that concept of learning presence or student self-regulation in online settings has, you know, a benefit in terms of being able to achieve at higher levels. So students engaged in a cycle of forethought and planning about their learning, monitoring and strategy use during their learning and reflection after they've engaged in activities that cycles back into how am I going to approach this going forward. It holds a lot of promise from both work that we've done and others have done on online learners. Students, so student self-regulation, I think, is important. Other questions? Were you able to control in any way for the reasons students did not complete their programs? Sorry, say that again? Were you able to control in any way for reasons why students did not complete their programs? Because there are a lot of reasons a student may not complete a program that has absolutely nothing to do with the program or the method of delivery. Uh, things like finances, right. things like family events, especially when you're talking about students who are not what we would call traditional students. Going yeah. to school is the only thing that they do. No, I, I think it's a great question and it's a great, you know, area for follow-up study. I mean, there's all kinds of qualitative research that could be done trying to figure out what are the, you know, predictors of student dropout. Be, you know, it's not just the balance of online to face-to-face. -to -face. There's all kinds of other life factors that get in the way and uh, you know telling students that they have to come to campus when they're already time constrained is not going to help them to complete a degree and understanding what are the conditions I think that's it's a great point we don't we we don't have that from this particular study but I think it's important information other questions okay oh. just want to know which journal you're going to publish this paper to Okay, this is going to be in the International Review of Research in Open and Distance Learning, and I see Jill wincing over there. <laughs> we we got to spread it around, Jill. We <laughs> is it, if is I it put possible? it in online learning, I'd be accused of unfairly using our journal as a platform, but uh, it wrote all. Um, is it possible to put that link or to put the site into the I can, conference? I can share the pre-publication version of this with Alex, and she can send it to everybody. It's it's all actually, I think, already on the website sunyresearch.net slash HPLO, or how people learn online. So SUNY Research, SUNY Research, all one word, dot net, backslash HPLO. Uh, 
Uh, it's a website where we put all of our preprint research up and freely available before it goes to publication. So you can find everything there. Um, yeah. Just as a teaser and preview, we've been working with uh, Kim and Kristen on trying to understand the benefits of Open SUNY Plus supports on students' uh, outcomes in terms of things like uh, course level completion and dropout, program dropout, and graduation, gradua graduation rates. And it looks promising, I'll just say that. Um, we did like a, a sample case study where we're looking at open SUNY versus non-open SUNY uh, programs and find, finding some interesting results. So a little tentative, optimistic, raw for open SUNY plus signature elements, it looks like they're gonna be. So stay tuned for that, okay. All right, thanks very much for your time, I appreciate it.